I'm here with Phil. Thank you so much, Phil, for joining me. Oh, you're very welcome, Sam. It's finally uh, it's good to finally see uh, see your face. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you mind uh, just kind of introducing yourself real quick and telling us what like what website you're with? Yeah, I'm. Uh, my name is Philip Jury, and I teach online leathercraft courses with a website called leathercraftmasterclass.com, and that is what I do. Perfect. Awesome. So I just wanted to quickly kind of share a story about how I had found your website and sort of like where I was at in my life at that time. And then kind of like what happened afterwards. Okay. So, um, so I've been involved with leather for almost five years, just sort of like playing around with it, just making wallets mostly for the first probably like four years, just really kind mm-hmm. of like, floundering with trying to find a direction. Okay. So up until about a year and a half ago, um, I was, I had purchased some templates online that were like acrylic templates, you know, and they're Mm -hmm. real nice, you know, nothing wrong with them. And I found myself in this place where I was just kind of like repeatedly making the same wallet over and over and over again. (laughs) And like, I'd save up my money and I'd buy better tools and like, I'd, you know, buy a side of leather and then I'd make, you know, 11 of the same exact bifold wallet out of the same exact leather and then try and sell them on like Etsy. And then I got to the point where I'd notice, I'd be like, Hey, that guy's selling the same wallet I'm selling because I recognize the template. And I just found myself in this place where I was like very burnt out. And I was like, I felt Mm -hmm. as though I had, exhausted all of the resources that were available. Like I was watching all the YouTube videos and I was seeing, you know, like, so there's a lot of really good information out there, but there's also a lot of information that was coming from people who were also learning. So it was kind of like, you know, I didn't really know where to look and I was pretty much ready to give up. Like I would sell a wallet every once in a while, but it just wasn't really going anywhere. So, what I really wanted to do was get involved in these more complex projects. Like I'd look at some of these, you know, um, real traditional pieces of luggage coming usually like out of England and things like that. And the, the, the makers that are there that have had businesses for hundreds of years, you know, and I'd say like, I really wanted to make something like that, but there just wasn't, there wasn't any resources available. There weren't any. And I looked hard, you know, I, I went to the, the bottom of the internet looking for <laughs> information. I, I feel we've, like we've I've, all been there. <laughs> yeah. And not to say that there wasn't good information out there because I know a lot of people put out a lot for free. That's really good. So I'm not trying to discredit yeah. them, but yeah. you know, I felt unmotivated. And then probably about a year ago, maybe a little longer. I, I remember seeing your post for the, the Bloomsbury attache case. And mm-hmm. I don't know how long has that one been out? Oh, God. Uh, I think just over a year now. Okay. So yeah. it was probably right when it was coming out. And I remember the video for like the handle course. And I remember yeah, thinking right. to myself, like, there it is. Like, that's what I've been looking for. Like, I finally found <laughs> it. You know, like I finally found the resource that I've been looking under every rock for for all these years. And I remember thinking like, you know, I can probably make something that sort of looks like a briefcase on my own, but I'll never be able to figure out the handle. Like the handle is just this like black magic sort of thing that is so <laughs> mysterious. Pure so sorcery. I, <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, I signed up for the, the, the course and um, loved every minute of it. it. You know, enjoyed all of the videos and um, learned so much. And I never really even did all the projects start to finish, but what I did was watched them and took bits and pieces from each one that helped me so much for um, just like whatever I decided to do in my, on my own creative pursuits. Yeah. And um, yeah, I just remember getting to this point where like I found what I was looking for and it like totally sparked this whole new like level of motivation in me. And Fantastic. yeah. And you know, I guess like one thing to kind of think about for myself is like, you know, whenever like a family member asked me, like, where did you, where did you learn leather craft or like, you know, who taught you or something like that? You know, I've never had an in-person lesson in my life. Nobody's ever shown me a single thing. So like most people would say that they're Mm self-taught, but like, I feel for myself personally, that's kind of like disingenuous because like, 
I did get such tremendous value and just like learn so many things so quickly by taking your course. And I think like what kind of sealed it in too is like you were, you were there and available. It wasn't just like a, a product that you sold me and you were gone and took my money and sort of like you were there for like the correspondence too. So I feel like in many ways, you know, even though we've never met in person, like you kind of had that mentor role. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, Yeah, no, it's very nice of you to say. Yeah. And and I mean (laughs) it too, you know, so, um, and thank you again for joining me. So like what, what I really want to do and what I'm sure many people would be interested in is kind of talk Mm -hmm. about like your experience with Leathercraft kind of like, your early years all the way through where you're at today and maybe the lessons you've learned. So I think an interesting place for me to start this conversation would be, where did you grow up? Oh, where did I grow up? I grew up in London, London, England, uh, in a uh, very posh affluent area called Tottenham. Okay. And uh, I think all the people from London will probably be laughing right now because (laughs) it is anything but. (laughs) But yes, it's a place in North London. And uh, yeah, that's where I I was born and uh, spent most of my life growing up. Okay, cool. A little street urchin. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds good. Yeah. So do you remember being interested in building things as a child? Were there any projects or like any hobbies you found yourself getting involved in? Yeah. Um, I think I was a very inquisitive child. I asked a lot of questions um, growing up. I remember everyone used to talk about how I just always used to ask questions all the time about everything on every subject. I just wanted to know things and I wasn't just happy with one answer. I was just annoying people all the time. But uh, I was one of those kids that would you'd buy me a, a toy car or something like a remote control car. And I'd get very bored of it very, very quickly. And then I'd want to know what's making the wheels turn, what's making you know the direction of the car go left or right with the remote control. And I'd always, always just take it apart, take the pieces off, add them to another car or modify things because I, I just couldn't leave things unexplained. I had to know. And, uh, and that, I guess that's still, that's still part of who I am today. I think I like to figure things out and uh, kind of just, I've always got that wonder. How is that done? How is that made? I have to find out. I have to figure this out. And so that, you know, that was me at a very, very early age. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. I I took a lot of things apart and never could always get them back together. So (laughs) (laughs) it resonates with me. Oh yeah. Um, So like, as you were getting a little bit older and do you remember like moving into maybe high school or I guess secondary school, like, you know, what, what is it that you wanted to do? Did you have something in mind that you wanted to do? To be honest with you, yeah. I mean, I knew that I was, I was very into working with my hands. I, I really kind of resonated more with, uh, you know, courses at school that were towards handcrafts and things like that. And when I left school, I left school at 16, which, which you can't do anymore. I think you have to stay on till 18 at the moment. I left school and got a job in carpentry i did an apprenticeship so i went to college uh, and then started an apprenticeship with uh, a london company uh, with carpentry and joinery working for them Um, so i think from from leaving school yeah definitely i wanted to to work with my hands okay that's definitely the direction was it like cabinetry or more it was it was a mixture of a lot of things from the beginning i mean they would uh, have me in the shop making you know doors frames cabinets uh chests of drawers things like that but they would also have me go outside on building sites and then try another aspect of that and they would Mm -hmm. kind of put me with different people who i would stay with for sometimes several months before moving me on to someone else so that i could get kind of a grasp of how different people work and uh kind of moving me around giving me someone to 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 be a mentor essentially so uh, that was that was my apprenticeship. Yeah, that's awesome. So, did you get to a point where you know you considered making that your your life's work, or was what sort of changed your mind? I mean, obviously, you're not a carpenter mm. now, so no. Well, uh, you know, it's it's trying to figure out the reasons why what motivated me to change. I think I really I enjoyed I liked carpentry. I didn't love carpentry, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I, I kind of enjoyed one aspect of it, but I got very, very bored very, very easily if I had to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And I kind of realized that I was, I really needed something to, to be a solution or a direction for my creativity. I needed to make new things and design new things and, and bring things to life. Whereas I, I felt that I couldn't quite do that in carpentry. I was, I found it quite stifling to be honest. Mm-hmm. Absolutely makes sense. So, um, after carpentry, what was your next sort of endeavor? Well, I did that for a lot of years, um, up until my late twenties. So I ended up moving to Canada in oh, okay. about 2008. So I carried on there. So I was doing carpentry out there as well. And, uh, yeah, so I've been doing it for a long time. I have, you know, something that resonated actually with one of your previous guests on the podcast with Martin Carswell. It was that kind of, I've done actually so many different things in search, searching for what I want to actually do. I mean, I spent time, uh, I got into bodybuilding in my, in my twenties and I spent time working in a gym for a bit. Didn't like that too much. Um, got into, I worked in a kitchen for a while. Couldn't deal with that kind of pressure. It it just, you know, I kept butting heads with the the head chef. Uh, (laughs) I worked, uh, where else did I? I became a a prison officer. Uh, Did that for less than a year. Hated that. Private security work. Did that. And uh, eventually, all the while I'm, I'm, you know, I'm I'm doing leather craft as, as my hobby and it's my passion. But I was constantly searching for what can I do as a profession but then do leather craft on the side. And then eventually I thought, you know, why don't I just do what I love to do? Right. Why not get as, as good at that as I pass, as I possibly can and right. then turn that into, into my career. Right. It's almost like you're just searching for this creative outlet and then you realize you had it the whole time. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it comes down to a lot of people kind of look down on those sometimes, not everybody, but a lot, a lot of people in society look down on people who haven't stuck out a job for very long and they keep moving to something completely different. But I, I see that as an individual who's really searching for their, for their purpose, for their meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, No, that's not always the case, of course, but a lot of the time people who really want to find out what they want to do in life end up trying as many things as possible. It's like if you lost your keys, you wouldn't keep looking in the same cabinet all the time. You would go to different areas and try different places in order to search for the thing that you need to find. And if you keep searching in the same place, that would just be madness. Right. Um, so I, I think I did a lot of searching, tried a lot of different things, and then it came down to going, you know what, I'm going to do this. It's awesome. Yeah. So, um, let's kind of back up a little bit. So you were going through all of these different occupations and at some point mm-hmm. you had to have been exposed to leather work. I mean, you said you yeah. kind of started as a hobby, like where, where was yeah. that initial exposure? Well, when I first moved to Canada, when I got there, um, I, I didn't have a job at the time. I was kind of searching as soon as I got there, trying to land uh, on my feet. And uh, a friend of the family used to make knives. Um, so he, he was an electrician by trade. He wasn't a knife maker by any standard, but he was, uh, that was his thing. And he had a forge at his house and he used to make knives and, and samurai swords and all sorts of things like that. And he said to me, uh, you know, would you like to come over trying to give me something to do or keep me entertained? And I said, yeah, okay. So I came over and uh, he showed me how to make a knife using a, an old Nicholson file. Cool. And uh, he kind of like, you know, forged it, sort of softened the steel, shaped the steel, and went through the hardening process and tempering and handle making, all that kind of thing. But then I wanted to put a sheath on the knife. And it was a walnut handled knife with a brass bolster and everything. And I wanted to put something quite traditional on it. Now he was more into making uh, like Kydex sheaths which is more of a, like a, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, a cardex is like a plastic synthetic plastic, for those right. who don't know. Yeah. Um, so I tried to look around, uh, to find a supplier, someone who could, I could buy leather from. I did a little bit of research, went onto knife forums and, and kind of like just had a look at some of the amazing work people were doing with she's. So I found, um, uh, a store that sold leather and leather tools, mostly like Tandy kit and stuff like that. And I went in, and I said to the guy, you know, do you have any vegetable tanned leather? I'd, li- I'd like to make a knife sheath. And I don't know why, but he was quite taken aback. He said, not many people actually know what le- vegetable tanned leather is. 
he almost seemed quite impressed. <laughs> I guess most people walking off the street and go, leather, please. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, so I explained to him what I wanted to do. He gave me a few pointers, uh, you know, and told me what I'll need to stitch it with and all that kind of thing. And I went home and I made this knife sheath. And it, it, it's not that it was bad. I stitched it with um, bowstring. So I was into archery at the time as well, making nice. English longbows and yeah, all that kind of thing. I've never heard of anybody using bowstring. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, it, I, it I think it's polyester uh, that they use. I'm not entirely sure. It's called something. It was Dacron 50 or something like that. Um, but I stitched it with a, a Dremel with a one mil drill bit. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> and I ended up, um, I ended up, painting it with polyurethane oil-based varnish, <laughs> minwax varnish. I remember that. And uh, then I didn't like that. So I dunked it in acetone to get rid of the varnish. <laughs> Ended up melting candle wax on the, all over it and then putting it in the oven to help it absorb. <laughs> definitely waterproof. <laughs> it definitely was. You know, you know what? That thing still looks brand new. I don't know how... I didn't make a hash of that because it's not something I would do now. I mean, now I laugh at that, but... Uh, you have it? Yeah, I still have I don't have it on me now, but uh, uh, I think yeah. I put some pic- pictures on the forum once. Oh, you, you did? Know, okay. But, yeah. Cool. That's awesome. But yeah, that's how, that I, that's how I kind of got into it. Seems like a common story where uh, people get into knife making and then they got a knife yeah. and then yeah. they need a sheath. They need somewhere yeah. to put it and then they forget about the knife making and... You know. Yeah, it's it's very strange how how you kind of almost fall into it sometimes because when I'd show people after I'd finished making the knife, I spent so freaking long making that knife. It was incredible. <laughs> but like, you know, when I finished it and I was showing people, they were mostly remarking at the sheath mm-hmm. because I'd I'd actually made a, a maple leaf because I'd moved to Canada. I wanted to do something kind of Canadian, and I I tooled the uh, the leaf. Mm-hmm. And then and stitched it on, and uh, everyone seemed to love that. And then that was actually from where I got my first commission, was from a, a chef that I knew that said, "Oh, can you make a sheath for my knives?" Mm-hmm. I was like, "Yeah, sure." And then he ordered a tool roll, and then his friends were ordering from me, and it, I kind of just that was my first taste of, uh, and I, I didn't intend on selling it either. Yeah, awesome, very yeah. cool. So you're kind of falling into being this knife sheath maker and uh yeah. wh- do you remember like where you were looking for instruction at the time well i mean the 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 place that i used to go and buy leather from the guy who ran it also did courses on the side so he would teach in person courses i think it was like two times a week or three times a week and on the weekends at the back of the shop so i used to go along to there and do kind of basic courses on cutting and stitching and skiving but it was mostly like with tandy tools and mm-hmm. very more geared towards leather tooling but he was a very good case maker it was more for rifle cases shotgun cases shotgun slips and things like that but mostly like leather tooling very very similar in fact to al stolman's i don't know if you've ever read any of his books yeah. like on case making yeah. yeah very very similar style to that Oh, cool. So in, in Canada, that most of the time, that's, that's the style. It's, it's more Western style. But I was very fascinated with the way that he would make cases and things like that because it was something that I, I love, love the construction of it. Uh-huh. It's the construction that, that fascinates me. And it's um, very similar to woodwork in that, in that sense, I guess. Yeah, you know, I, I guess this kind of leads me to my next question where I was going to ask, like, you know, were there any lessons that you learned in your, your previous occupations that you sort of brought with you into leather work? Like you mentioned the, you know, kind of woodworking in cases. Is there anything else that you want to kind of tell us about? What did I bring from my previous occupations into this one? Um, working in the prison helped me deal with difficult customers. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Slightly less confrontational and violent though. Um, I would say, you know, from my woodworking days, something that I do now religiously um, is a design brief okay. for absolutely, absolutely everything. Um, I like to have written down a whole, I start with good questions. So I say to myself, okay, what's this? Say this, it's a bag. What's this bag for? Who is it for? What does it hold? Mm-hmm. What features is it going to have? What leather do I need to select? What areas need reinforcement? What linings am I going to uh, have on it? What handles? What kind of construction? 
And um, I start formulating a lot of good questions before moving on to answers. So I, I, by the end of the design brief, I know exactly what I'm going to do, almost like following a manual after that, that I wrote myself. Mm-hmm. Now, you're always going to change something along the way. You can never predict absolutely everything or solve all the problems on a design brief. But having a design brief just allows you to go, okay, what do I need to do next? And then you go to the next step. This is what you do, then that's what you do. And even now, designing uh, leather craft courses, that's exactly what I do. Mm-hmm. I have uh, you know, sometimes four or five pages with every step written out in the right direction in pencil so that I can rub it out, re- reorganize the order of things depending on what comes up. So yeah, I'd say what would I bring from my previous occupation? I would say using a design brief when it comes to uh, creating something new, especially. Very smart. Yeah. You know, I've dabbled in a little bit of woodwork and, you know, I, for, for me personally, I found like some of the lessons I learned in like <clears throat> accurate measurement held true with like leather work, you know, like, you yeah. Know, Finding just some of those like little details, you know, they're not always exactly the same, but you kind of pick up no. some tips and tricks. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a different medium, but I, I I actually found the transition from woodworking to leatherwork quite easy. It's a, it's a very similar mindset of, of finding problems and solving problems, right? And uh, you know, working with your hands, measuring mm-hmm. accurately, you know, measure once, measure once, cr- cut twice. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's how it's not I do true things. guys that's not true <laughs> measure twice cut once yeah I'm only okay teasing. <laughs> so um so where'd you go next then you're you're attending these courses learning a little mm. bit of case making yeah right, what came next well i mean i, I did that for uh, a number of weeks but after a while it wasn't i wasn't really into the tooling as much i mean I, it's not that i don't mind leather tooling it's you know, that is very much an artwork that I can appreciate, but I didn't enjoy doing it as much. Mm. I was more like, okay, now I've used this style of leather. What other leathers are there out there? And what other techniques can I use? And, you know, how can I expand on this, you know, a very basic foundation? I mean, it's not exactly formal training, but it's, you know, it was a foundation that kind of accelerated me ahead so that I can get the results that I wanted quicker. Mm-hmm. But um, I very quickly started to ask the kind of questions that they didn't really answer for me there. And, uh, and then I kind of looked into more English style of leatherworks, um, you know, attache cases, briefcases, things like that. Like what you mentioned, that was really what I had my eye on. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're looking for answers to these questions. Do you Mm -hmm. remember where you started to find some of these answers? I mean, in order to to learn some of the techniques that I was looking for, I had to kind of search for leathercraft manuals, books, um, and things like that. And a lot of them were very, very old. Right. And that's kind of the direction that I had to go because I couldn't really find anybody at that point who could answer the kind of questions that I had about these things. So, you know, I was buying as many, many books and uh, training manuals um, from you know institutions in London as I possibly could, um, in order to start kind of expanding on the the, the basics and the knowledge that I'd received so far. Mm-hmm. Awesome, yeah. I know you've got some of those books that you've got available too that are super cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> so th- I would say you know, or I'd ask like you know, what are these sort of early moments where you're looking through these books and you're kind of going oh, that's how I need to be pursuing this. Did you have any moments where like you had like a revelation of a new direction or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, there's always those kind of moments where you, it suddenly dawns on you and you realize the answer of what you've been looking for, for so long, you know, how do you stitch through a 45 degree corner? How do you attach hardware to to leather and all these kind of things that you have in your mind like you know how is that done yeah there are a lot of those moments that 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 you get but i think that should never stop happening you know if you really want to move into this craft and keep expanding your knowledge all the time and getting better and better and better you should always have those kind of moments where you're like oh yes 
of course, mm -hmm. because it, you know, when a period of time goes by where you haven't discovered anything new for a while, you're essentially no better off than the last time you found something out. You know, you, you haven't really grown, you haven't really developed. So I think it's all, that's why I always try and teach people to kind of push the boundaries of what you think you can do, because usually you can do better than, uh, than you think you can. Right. Yeah. I've heard you talk about maintaining that student sort of mindset. The beginner's mind. Yeah. Yeah. The beginner's mind. That's really good advice. So um, as you're kind of breaking down these really technical documents, you know, these like older books, do you mm -hmm. kind of remember like what it was like when you were trying to make sense of them? Cause I've seen a lot of these older books and many of them don't have any pictures or, you know, it, they, they're yeah. technical. <laughs> they're, they're tough to digest, you know, even, yeah. even now they are. So do you remember like what your process was for trying to make sense of them? Some of these old, yeah. Some of these old books and manuals, they assume that you have knowledge already. Right. So, you know, you're going to have to start running before you can walk with them. But I, I think, and a lot of, a lot of people get stuck on the feeling of they need to understand something fully before they move forward or before they try something. Mm -hmm. And I've always been of the mindset where get, have a basic understanding or try and understand what they're saying and then start doing it. And sometimes you need to be doing it to really fully understand or appreciate what they're trying to say. And it might not make sense, first of all. And then you start doing and you're like, oh, yes, of course. Or you, f you fail and you think, mm, that doesn't work. Try another way. And it works. And then you look back at the book and that was exactly how they said that you should be doing it. <laughs> yeah. So, you, yeah. <laughs> cool. so I, I think the, the best way to, to move through something that you find very technical is to start doing it, first of all. Don't wait until you you feel that you fully understand it before moving forward because you can never really fully understand something unless you've done it anyway. Uh -huh. So just start moving. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, another factor that makes it even a little bit more challenging is like um, a lot of the materials that they used in the older you know, times are no longer oh, yeah. available or, yeah. you know, so you got to kind of make sense of that. So, yeah, exactly. Things like millboard and buckram and, uh, straw boards and <laughs> right. just like really obscure materials and, and leathers that don't exist anymore, like seal leather. I don't even know if you could buy that. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. It probably wouldn't go over real well on the internet. <laughs> oh, no, I, I don't think it would. Yeah. So was there anything that, you know, any occupations or any trainings that occurred in between you sort of, transitioning away from these careers that you've mentioned and sort of moving into leather more full time? Yeah. I mean, I remember I, when I, I gave up carpentry, came back to the UK, worked in a kitchen for a few weeks. That didn't work out. Um, applied for the prison service in the UK, uh, went through all the basic training and everything like that, became a prison officer. And that was, you know, that was for somebody, if you identify as a creative individual, I, I wouldn't recommend that occupation. <laughs> it is, it is not for the creative individual. So, um, that just began to destroy my soul very, very slowly and, and turned me into some, someone that I didn't want to become. Um, someone was very difficult to be around all the time. And eventually I thought, you know what, this is, this is going to be the end of me doing this. If I don't, do what I love doing. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to do it. And I'm going to resign to doing this. So I left. Well, I didn't leave there. I went and found another job working for a local security firm, uh, which was like four days on four days off. So I left the prison service, gave up that job, you know, it was well paid and all that kind of thing. I just, I just didn't care anymore. Um, did some security work on the side and decided that I was going to use this opportunity to launch a business in Leathercraft. So I spent the next two years focusing on honing my skills, pushing myself to a different level that I'd never pushed myself to before. I was able to, when I was at work, I was just like a lone security guard. So I'd spend the entire time studying uh, business, studying Leathercraft, studying marketing, studying everything that I could. I'd even walk around with a, with a pretend earpiece 
uh, so that people would think I was doing my job, but I was actually listening to audio books. <laughs> nice. I take my notebook out and people think I was really, you know, vigilant in my job of writing notes constantly, right. but I was just writing down important stuff that I needed to remember. And I just got volumes and volumes and volumes of all these notes on, on all the subjects that I felt that I needed to, uh, to understand. And that's when I kind of also got into doing co- online courses. So I do a course on photography as well. I do nice. a course on business. I do a course on effective communication uh, and all these things. So I, was, I spent two years learning and learning and learning. Uh, I, <laughs> I've never told anybody this before. <laughs> I even, at the beginning, I bought a van. And I converted the back of it into an office. And for two years, I'd sneak into the back of it <laughs> and spend the entire day there. If, if somebody wanted to call me for an incident, they could just radio me. And that was yeah. it. And no one ever found out. No that's, one ever found out. That's and, awesome. But, yeah. And then in the four days off, I would be working my butt off. I, I made a workshop in my backyard and built that up from foundations to the roof. And... Uh, I just thought, you know what, I, I have to do this. And I just focused on that, you know, and it was, it was tough. It was really tough, especially, you know, trying to decide when I was going to stop doing this and move full time into leather craft, mm-hmm. uh, which is, is such a difficult transition. I get asked all the time, when do I stop the day job and move into leather craft? And it is one part preparation and one part just luck. You know, right. you, 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 and, and faith, you have really have to have faith in yourself that right. you're going to pull through. Um, and then just think to yourself, what's the worst that could possibly happen? Right. And this, and this might sound really nerdy. I'll do a design brief on the worst case scenario. No, so all the worst sense. possible things that could happen. I get, I lose my money, can't pay my mortgage. Um, house burns down, every, list everything that could possibly go wrong, then figure out a solution of what you would do for everything. And that is just the ultimate fear killer for me because then you're prepared. Mm-hmm. And then if the worst happens, which it really ever does, you know exactly what to do. There's a, there's a process for that. It's the unknown that really stops people from, from progressing and, and moving into something they, they love doing. No, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really good. And it sounds like you took a really smart approach to it too where – You know, like for someone like me, like I'm not a full-time leather worker. Like this is what I would consider to be like something I do for fun. Right. And, you know, I'm totally going about it the incorrect way because I'm just like dumping tons of money into it with no sort of like goal for a business at the moment. But, you know, like, and I think that's what a lot of people do wrong, but it sounds like you like learned how to um, really make a business out of it, you know? So like, having those like finance skills and like learning that like, if I buy this tool, then that puts me a hundred dollars in the red and I need to make this profitable, profitable business rather than just like buying everything that you like. You know, I think a lot of people focus on the craft and not the business aspect. Absolutely. Yeah. I I think, um, I mean, in the beginning I set aside enough money to buy what I needed to get started. Right. And then I devoted any profits would go back into the business, uh-huh. um, you know, for at least the first year. So I needed to have enough savings to keep me going, but um, it was, yeah, I definitely couldn't afford to keep buying really expensive tools or, or tools that I didn't absolutely need. Right. You know, some, some tools would have saved me a lot of time, but I was still skiving bag panels by hand with a skiving knife. Right. But that, because I, I couldn't afford a skiving machine at the time, but that definitely gave me the upper hand uh-huh. in in learning how to 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 use these tools with my hands. So it was a case of like, I can't afford to spend a lot of money on this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know when the profits came back in, most of it, at least most of it, went back into in the business itself. Right. No, that's really smart. Um, do you remember like when you first started kind of transitioning into? full-time leather work. Like, do you remember a moment of being like, I had this expectation that this is what life was going to be like. And then was, was there anything that you found to be different than your expectation? Uh, yeah. Um, that's difficult. Uh, I don't know if was there anything different because everything is new, right? Uh, you, you can't really, you know, when you when you haven't had a full time business before, you can't really go into it with all these expectations. 
and they turn out to be true is, is you have to go into it with a, a very open mind and realize that you aimed in this direction, but it took you in this direction and you have to keep maneuvering and adapting and changing and learning all the time um, in order to stay afloat and stay profitable. Um, but is there anything that I, you know, I, I think I underestimated the power of video early on. Okay. You know, I was, I was really getting into the photography and things like that and, you know, learning what I learned from the online courses on how to, uh, you know, portray my leather goods in the best possible way to make, you know, mouthwatering photos, or at least is what I thought. Um, everybody loves their first efforts, don't they? And then mm -hmm. <laughs> you realize they're terrible later down. Um, but yeah, I, I think video, transitioning to video was one of the, one of the greatest moments in Leathercraft uh, for me, because it really allows you to connect with uh, prospective customers and people mm -hmm. who are interested in your, leather, in your leather goods, because a lot of the time they're buying you, they're buying the craft, the right. person who's doing it by hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a almost a sense of romance to that. And I think it's, um, it's one of the, one of the things that I would recommend to everybody is, is put your face on camera. They're not expecting you to present beautifully. Right. They don't care if you're a little bit nervous. Why wouldn't you be? You know, but when you put yourself, you put a, a face to the brand, it makes such a powerful connection. And I think uh, I didn't expect that. But when I started doing that, it definitely made a lot more people contact me, for sure. Yeah, because I know you're a real person and not just you know, oh, yeah, for sure. a group of people. Yeah, because sometimes you, you'll go on... Um, and you'll know this, you go on a, a, a company that makes bags or wallets or whatever, and you're scrolling through and you're expecting at least one photo of somebody making something somewhere, but mm -hmm. there isn't. It's all just finished products. You right. kind of know that they don't make their stuff. They have it made for them, probably some part of the world where it's going to be cheaper. Um, but uh, for people who really want to buy into something handmade, bespoke, custom, you know, being able to see someone's face and you know, showing them a video of the process at the very least. Mm -hmm. But I found showing your face actually really powerful, yeah. really powerful. It's great advice. Were there any other sort of, I guess, best way I can describe them is sort of like peripheral skills that you found helpful? Like I know you mentioned photography, which is mm. so important when you're trying to sell something handmade oh, yeah. and, and video. Was there anything else that you found that you were kind of learning on the side? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it's one of these cases where you can never give, give me one piece of advice. There's, it's never one piece of advice. That's not how craft or business or anything works. Nothing runs on one piece of good advice because there's always, there's many of these powerful one pieces of good advice. But yeah, you're right. There's, there's going to be lots of different things that you need to, some that you need to get very good at and some that you need to be proficient in. Um, photography, videography, your craft itself. Um, but understanding that there's a story to your craft as well that you need to give people to give them context and also effective communication. So buying books or watching videos on copywriting, the ability to write good copy. So selling with words essentially so that you can do your absolute best to show your products off or describe them in the best possible light so that customers are going to buy from you. Um, you know, it's very often you see on Instagram, somebody saying, I've just made this. If anybody in is interested, DM me, you know, it's, 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 it's lazy marketing, <laughs> but it's, but it's usually people that don't realize that they need to do a bit more than that. Right. You need to, you need to build a story. You need to build some, fanfare around what you've done to show them the amount of work that you've put into making this as, as exceptional as you possibly can. And uh, that definitely makes a difference. So the being able to describe what you're doing, being able to communicate with people, how good your products are, why they, why they're set apart from other people's products, what makes them better, what makes them special. You should be able to articulate this into something um, that when you're, you know, interested customers or clients read it, it, their mouth starts watering. That's that, that's the kind of effect that you're looking for. You know, when you say, you know, DM me if interested, you're putting them to work. Why do, they shouldn't have to work to, you know, you could even say something, I don't know, I'm just making an example. You could even say something like, um, 
emoji thumbs up if you want me to DM you with more information. <laughs> no, you're doing the work. How, how simple is that? Right. And then you see all these thumbs up and other people are seeing the thumbs. Oh, everyone's interested. You know, it's, and then other people are interested because people are interested. It's, and it snowballs. So there's all these little things that you can do to kind of portray your work in the best light possible. Because if you're not selling your work properly, you're doing your customer an injustice because they would be happy to have something that's handcrafted like that. And you're denying of them denying them of that because you're not doing a good enough job selling what you've put so much time and effort into and you everyone deserves that yeah that's awesome it's really good so you are transitioning into being a full-time leather worker you're putting your heart and soul into it all now is this um is this finch england or is this a different sort of iteration yeah. prior to that there, there was a couple of different names uh terrible uh but yeah no I, I settled quite early on 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 finch england okay um yeah so that was uh i did that for two or three years and then that's kind of when i started transitioning into into teaching the craft okay now what were the the early products that you were making in finch england were you just kind of taking commissions as they came in or were you trying to sort of yeah, I mean, it, it's it started out with kind of I I decided that I was going to decide what customers want. I was <laughs> going to be I want I want to make what I want to make, and then I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to try and find people to buy it, <laughs> and uh, and that that was that was my process in the beginning, and and that really didn't work uh, work out as well. You know, I'd make a few sales that way, and I was able to you know pay the bills with that, but it wasn't, I was kind of surviving. I wasn't really, the business wasn't really scaling or growing or anything like that. It wasn't until I kind of moved into more commission work um, that I then started to be making things like bags, handbags, cases, a lot of watch straps. I I don't know. I mean, times changed, but at that time there was a lot of money in watch straps. So I was doing a lot of exotic leather watch straps. I was doing a lot of uh, commissions for private collections for people who collect watches and things like that. So I, don't, I mean, I haven't sold uh, watch straps for a very long time, but in, in the day, that was that was where it was. Um, wallets, the you know the usual suspects. But it was when I started getting into real custom work where the customer could say, "I want to buy a handbag for my wife. I want it to be an ostrich. I want it to have this many." panels i wanted to have you know this many pockets it needs to have this color hardware and things like that and you you're kind of working with them because once you get a few of those their friends who are also in the same circles also want something special and unique and things like that so that was uh for me that was kind of the best part of it um yeah before transitioning do you remember if you received any advice that was particularly helpful when you were first starting out? I know you've mentioned before that like you've been lucky to talk to some master artisans that, you know, or maybe of the older generation. Did you get any Mm -hmm. advice from anybody that was, that really stuck with you? Mm. It's an interesting question. Any advice that really stuck with, with me, I guess probably the best advice I've ever been given by an old friend of mine passed away now was if anything's worth doing, it's worth doing well. And it's, you know, I've, I've heard that from many places, but it was just him, the way he said it. Uh, because the way he explained things is when you, when you make something truly unique and heirloom quality, it's going to be around longer than you are. And it's going to be, it's going to survive you. Mm-hmm. And that's your name. That's your craft. That's your legacy. And if you can approach everything that you make with the idea of this could potentially be my legacy one day, this is what people see when I'm gone, when I'm not here. And I think it's that, that kind of thought process of, yeah, I'm making something that could last many generations after I'm gone. It's my legacy. It's all that's left of me. And uh, I, I think, you know, that, that for me, that hit home quite well. Yeah. So yeah, it's awesome. Okay, <laughs> so you're you're working through Finch England, and eventually you get to the point where you decide that you'd like to start doing more teaching. 
So Mm -hmm. can you kind of walk me through that transition? Yeah, I mean, there wasn't necessarily an intent behind it at that point in time. Uh, I remember there was a local guy um, in the same town as me, actually, and he contacted me. And he asked me, you know, do I do lessons? Can I do lessons? And first thing I thought was like, no, I'm too busy to be doing that kind of thing. It's uh, it's not something I really want to do or thought about doing up until that point. And uh, but he kept pestering me all the time because he really wanted to 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 learn and, and make something for himself. So eventually, I was just you know I got tired of all these requests all the time because it was just back and forth and emails and back and forth. And I thought to myself, okay, if I'm going to take a day off for this guy, it's going to cost me because I'm not going to be able to produce uh, what, while I'm teaching him. So it's like wasting a day. So he's going to have to cover that and then some. So I threw a big number at him thinking ah, he's, he's not going to be interested. And I'm half hoping that he's not interested either because I'm too busy. And he immediately came back and said, yeah, let's do it. I was like, oh, okay, fair enough. And uh, came to the workshop and he had this, this like little Tandy kit. I think Tandy sells kits or something like that. Mm. And it was like, uh, I think it was, it was actually a card holder or a wallet or something like that. And you, you've got to tool it and then you've got to stitch it together. I think it was you know, lace it together. Anyway, um, he thought we were going to do that. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, that's not what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not particularly great at tooling anyway. That's not, that's not my forte, but, um, yeah. And he, he loved it and he kept coming back and, and kept wanting more and more. And, uh, and that's when I actually realized I really enjoy this because every time that I show him something new, whether it's how to stitch a piece of leather together, how to rub a burnisher along an edge and get a shiny edge and things like that, you just watch someone's face light up and you get to relive that moment that you had when you first kind of felt that, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then I thought, I really enjoy this. I enjoy teaching. Um, so I, I put an advert, a local advert out for people that are interested in the craft. And then all of a sudden people were coming in going, yeah, I'd, I'd like to spend a day with you making a wallet. And, and I had a whole range of different kind of people from people who wanted to do leather craft as a hobby, people who wanted to do it professionally, doctors, lawyers, all sorts of people would come in um, to learn this, even if they didn't have any interest on doing it outside of it. It was just they wanted to take their mind away from, say, the corporate world and do something they felt was creative um, that kind of gave them something for their soul, I guess you could uh, describe it as. But, yeah, a whole host of different people. And uh, I'd, I'd really started enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure there's just so many people in the world that, you know, went down a path sort of like yours, only they never made the leap to to get away from the job that they didn't like, you know, and yeah. like maybe this kind of gives them a creative outlet to sort of just have some fun and do something they enjoy. Correct. Yeah. 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 Sometimes it's a bit of a band aid. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, whatever works for you, I guess. But if it works for them, if they're happy, I'm happy. We're all happy. <laughs> right. Yeah. So now you're doing this full time, right? So you're no longer running a, an actual leather craft business. Well, I mean, it is a business, but it's, it's a teaching business now, right? It is at the moment. It's, a, it's just a teaching business. Yeah. Okay, For cool. Sure. So um, I wanted to ask kind of like, this brings us a little bit closer to, to current day. So where do you look for, for inspiration on your new projects? Inspiration on new projects. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Um, you know what? Quite put quite simply from uh, students of the masterclass, from the projects that they make, from the discussions that we have, you know, over emails or messages and things like that. And getting feedback from people saying, I'd love to learn how to do this. I'd love to learn how to do that. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really inspirational to see people getting so into something that I absolutely love to. Mm-hmm. And it brings such a great connection that really the, the people that inspire me the most are, are the people who are learning and then contacting me saying, oh, it was amazing. I finally understood why this is the way it is and how that works. And for the longest time, I couldn't figure it out. And that, that's really kind of inspiring. It, it keeps, me, keeps me on my toes and, and it keeps me producing uh, the best content I possibly can. Nice. So when you're, when you're 
giving advice to people just getting into leather craft. Mm. If you could pick maybe one or two skills for people to practice with intention, you know, I, th- I think it's easy to overlook that. Like, you know, in some sports, let's say tennis, for example, people might practice a tennis swing over and over and over again, same with golf. But, uh, you know, that gets overlooked in a technical handcraft, you know. Like, are, do you have a recommendation for a skill that people could practice with intention that would sort of progress them quickly? I really feel that there is a bit of a tendency in leather craft um, with people who have just discovered something new, like an aha moment, like when they first learn how to hand stitch with a decorative angle on each side, there is a bit of a tendency to go, right, I've mastered that. Now I'm not going to use it until I need to do it. Or they learn how to skive a perfectly straight hand sky for the first time and then don't do it again until they absolutely need to on a project. Well, that to me is, is just the very beginning of learning how to perform that skill. Um, when I first started, when I was really kind of focusing on improving all the time, even though I, I felt that I understood certain aspects, I would take, uh, you know, cut like a strip of four inch leather across an entire shoulder. So we got this long four inch strip. I'd curl it up, put it inside my clams. I'd mark a seam with a prick and iron. I would hand stitch that then I would run a crease along it, burnish it, and then cut that thin strip off. And I would keep making my way through that coil until there was just a, an entire bag of these little strips of nicely burnished, hand-stitched, creased leather. I'm going to just do hours and hours and hours of that. And then I would take, uh, say, a piece of hide, say five inches by five inches, and I would write down next to it, I want to split this down from 1.5 millimeters to 0.6 with a 0.1 millimeter tolerance. So by the time I've done, I'm going to split that down by hand, skiving, skiving, skiving. Even though it, I, did, I would never need to do that, I would just buy the leather in the right thickness. Or it taught me those hand skills. And you know, obviously, I would often just slice right through it and have to start again. But I knew very early on, I, in order to get good at something, you have to invest something in it, whether it's time, whether it's money, whether it's energy, resources, whatever it is, everything has to be paid for. So buying hides to practice on, you know, you can go to tanneries or suppliers and just say, what's not selling? Can you give me a discount on that? Something has got a bit of a mark on it or it's a hideous color that nobody wants, buy it. It's an investment in your skills. You know, people wouldn't say, I'm not investing 200 pounds on a, on a, on a, on something to learn that could become my career, you would think, yeah, obviously I'm going to spend that kind of money on it. So, you know, same with leather. Oftentimes people think, oh no, I, d- I just don't want to damage the leather. It's an investment. You have to, you're going to have to give up something in order to learn. So I would set myself these tasks to learn uh, as much as I could. It's very similar to, in fact, there was uh, one of the online students, uh, Magic Dave, <laughs> Dave Morello um, is on the, on the forum. He, he mentioned a book on the forum, the first 20 hours to learn anything. I've messed that title up, but it's based around, it's usually uh, the first 20 hours where you learn the bulk of everything with intentional, you know, uh, mindful practice. Um, Because that's your 80-20. That's the 20% that's going to give you 80% of the results. And the rest of your career, you're chasing that last little bit. So if you can dedicate 20 hours onto hand stitching and time yourself, spend half an hour on it, stop your timer, note it down and just get those 20 hours in, whether it's stitching, whether it's edge finishing, whether it's skiving or any of the skills that you really want to get good at. Um, so if you can get your 20 hours in, that's uh, a good way. And then you can work on your 10,000 hours to, uh, to world-class mastery, <laughs> right? <laughs> or whatever the figure is now. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so important. It's really good advice. You know, I, one skill that I've started learning ever since I joined your course was is stitching with an awl. And, you know, it's a, okay. it's a daunting task to take on, you know, but like after so many hours of practice, you know, you get to a point where you can make it look, you know, pretty good, but then you're always, for me personally, I'm always sort of just trying to get a little bit better, a little bit better. And I feel like that's a really good skill for me to, to practice just kind of whenever I've got some free time. 
absolutely. No, that's a good idea. I mean, um, skill with the all is one of those things where, you know, people say, what's the point of using an all? Well, there's, there's many scenarios where you don't really have much of a choice. You have to use it, you know, certain handles, certain angles, certain thicknesses. Um, you're going to need to have that kind of hand skill and proficiency. And if you spend all your time only ever using a, a you know, stitching chisel, pricking iron or whatever to go all the way through the leather and fully penetrate, you're not really developing that skill very much. So when you absolutely have to use it, is probably using uh, through a, a difficult point in your project. You don't have the proficiency for it. So sometimes I like using it, even if I don't have to, even if I could just penetrate all the way through. Um, and it was one of those things. I just use it almost universally. Awesome. Very cool. So I got a couple of questions here that are, um, I guess, changing gears a little bit, just on kind mm-hmm. of like, you know, progressing through leathercraft and advice you might have for people. So I think like a lot of the the inclination these days, or maybe a bigger question is like, should I build a store with available items for sale Mm -hmm. or like, should I become perhaps more like a generalist and take on custom pieces as they come in and just sort of make, make whatever you want, you know? So having a set product line or do you have any thoughts on that? I think the answer to that question would come very far down the line once you've identified your target market, right? what they want and where their attention is and whether Mm -hmm. or not you can get it. I think that, that would, that wouldn't be a, I don't think that would be a starter question. That would be a a finisher question. (laughs) Once you've identified, you know, uh, a need in the market for something. Uh, And to, and today, you know, it's, um, I would, I would probably be looking towards making solutions for new tech coming out. I would mm-hmm. definitely, definitely be looking to that if I was to get back into uh, the full-time making thing, um, which I have no intention of doing right now. I, you know, I, I love this side of it, to be honest. But uh, I would be looking at, at, at tech, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of products that I think are eventually going to be redundant. And I don't think it's a great idea to build a business on things that are a ticking time bomb for sales. And I was recently asked, somebody uh, contacted me and asked about um, starting a business and they want to start making leather covers for checkbooks. Um, You know, but I can't remember the last time I saw a check, you know, actually it was last year, an elderly relative wanted to, (laughs) Wanted to treat me to uh, me and my missus to a weekend in Paris. They so they wrote me a check <laughs> for a birthday gift, and uh, I remember having to walk into town, <laughs> queue up, uh, and you know to see the uh, the teller. And uh, yeah, it was an unusual experience. I think I was a teenager last time I saw. It. But I mean, if we, if we're talking about redundant, um, uh, you know, things, I, I think something like that. So even a wallet, because now personally. I have a card holder that stays in the car and I only ever take it out. If I need to go back to the car to get it, I pay for everything on my phone and I'll put like a 50 between the phone case and the phone in case I have to use cash. Right. And you know, if you, if you want to see where the world is going, if you look at places in East Asia and some places they wouldn't even take a card or anything like that. Everything, everybody pays with their phone. It's just the way things are. And that is usually where our future is going. So I think if you're, if you're getting to Leathercraft now, find out what the new tech is, what's coming out, go onto forums, see what people are saying about it, go onto product, product reviews for things and uh-huh. see what people are saying about the product review. What's the most common problem that people are having that gives that product a, a low star review? Is it the case that it comes in? Is it the fact that you keep dropping it? Does it need something to hold it? Is it a solution that you, your products could be, you know, if it's, is it a problem that your products could be a solution for? And I think with that kind of mindset, it's constantly looking for a market that could buy something that you create. I think you'll be onto a winner. But if you're of the mindset of, I want to make something and then see who wants to buy it, it, it if, that really never works for me. It was always trying to find people who have a problem with something and can I make a product that will solve that problem? Good. Definitely. Great advice. 
So um, I was wondering if you could kind of wind down this conversation with some recommendations for maybe some uh, materials like, you know, other than obviously your, your wonderful website, but like maybe do you have um, a recommendation for a book or two, maybe related to Leathercraft or maybe unrelated to Leathercraft that you found to be particularly helpful when you were kind of getting going? Hmm. Uh, with regards to Leathercraft, there's, there's more and more coming out now uh, around Leathercraft. But, you know, since we mentioned it earlier, the Al Stolman books on case making, yeah. I think are the most underrated books on, on leather craftsmanship that there is. I mean, there's been some fantastic books that have come out in recent times and old times, but there's something about those books that I think even if you're into more English or French or European style in general, um, the construction methods that he puts out in those books are fantastic. And uh, I think you can even get them on downloads now. Probably. Through Tandy. I think Tandy does them. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, if, having the book as well is, is quite nice to do. Um, but yeah, nice. that would probably be the one. The nice part about those is they're like almost all pictures. So yeah. you can really follow Precisely. along. Yeah. yeah. Those are cool. Were there any other books that you found helpful, like unrelated to leather? Like when you mentioned kind of like mm. business books or yeah. things like that. I think one of the, and you know what, going back to when you introduced me to, uh, in this podcast, you were talking about your own journey and you said that um, you were putting wallets out there and then you were noticing other people with the exact same wallets. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, th this is, I, I find, and I, I call it this, the wallet wall. Okay. A lot of people <laughs> hit, hit the wallet wall and bounce off as in because after wallets comes, you know, handbags, cases, bags in general. And a lot of that is daunting to people. So they just become infinitely slightly better and better and better at making wallets. But so are thousands of other people. Right. And is that, you know, and it's then, you know, a very saturated marketplace, uh, unless you can set yourself apart, of course, in your marketing. But what I would recommend as a book that's not related to Leathercraft is probably the Blue Ocean Strategy. Okay which is about, it describes uh, entering a market that's, that's very saturated as a red ocean, as in there are tons of sharks in there and everybody's ripping each other apart. Usually it's a, a fight to the bottom for pricing and uh, nobody wins. Whereas if you can figure out a new direction for the market, if you can create something, invent something that is different or new or perhaps the same, but marketed in a different way, presented in a different way, something that's fundamentally different from the rest, you can then stand out and you can then swim into your own ocean, which is nice and blue. So that's why they call it the blue ocean strategy. So it's a, it's a great book for people who want to do this as full-time leather crafters. Um, but it's a great read in general, but yeah, blue ocean strategy. Um, definitely some, some great points in there. Yeah. I'll have to check that one out. All right. Well, is there anything that you wanted to discuss that we didn't get a chance to go over? Uh, not really. How are you getting on with your latest case? I see you're making a, a new yeah. case on your Instagram there. Yeah, good, good. I'm kind of good. Good to see video. Yeah, I'm kind of at the hurry up and wait phase where I'm sending off the leather for uh, splitting because I don't have a a way to split big panels. So I'm just kind of sitting yeah. around and waiting for things to come in through the mail. Yeah, you know, that, I mean that that can be a pain in the ass sometimes, can't it? With um, trying to split down a piece of leather because. You, you know exactly what you want. You want this leather, but it only comes in these sizes, which right. is totally unsuitable for what you want. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's my next, uh, uh, big purchase. I think is, is getting a bad knife splitter. Really cool. Yeah. Those things are uh, daunting to say the least. That's, that's awesome though. They, they can be. Yeah. Very, very expensive. And I think one of the biggest issues is, is new parts, you know, cause some of the, the I've cheaper that. models are older, and uh, trying to trying to get new parts unless you can fabricate them yourself or know someone that does that could be that could be a bit of a challenge but um yeah it's definitely ha uh, good to have mm -hmm. recently turned turned down one but it was um a 12 inch and i think it's not quite wide enough for mm. some of the projects it is like oh no i'm gonna wait for a slightly larger one maybe 14 <laughs> if you're gonna buy one you might as well get a the one you want Oh, you know. If I was going to buy one, I, I would probably start a splitting service to start paying for it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. How can I make that thing make me money <laughs> to get your right. money back? Right, Absolutely. right. Yeah. What I found with this project, you know, is like with this whole, 
I don't know how it is in England right now, but you know, we're still, well, we're, we're supposed to still be locked down. Whether people are following that or not is a different story, but with, you know, the yeah. whole COVID-19. So still it's just been, strict here. yeah, it's just been tough to get parts and like, you know, little knickknacks that are supposed to be for the, you know, the briefcase and locks and everything. Oh and yeah. Stuff getting, you know, held up in customs and all that. So there's a lot of logistics that goes into these bigger projects. Like, Oh, for sure. I mean, it's, yeah, sometimes it involves investing a lot of money into making sure that you have exactly what you need every single time and, and having like an inventory that you can pull from. But that's, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of money involved in doing that. There is. Um, but yeah, it's the same here. And I don't know any leather supplies that are open now in the UK. They might be, forgive me if, uh, for those listening who are leather suppliers in the UK, but I haven't seen anybody open and uh, word has it that everyone's still closed. So I've had to be ordering everything from Italy at the moment, uh, yeah. which is good because Tuscany has some great leather. So <laughs> right, right. <laughs> not too bad. Well, cool. So is there anything exciting you can tell us uh, that's on the horizon for Weathercraft Masterclass? I know you like to keep it under wraps until it's ready, but anything cool coming? Well, I learn the hard way. Sometimes you, uh, I have had courses where I've, I've, I've filmed for two weeks and uh, something goes wrong. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> with with uh, yeah, I, I did one once on uh, on hand dyeing, and uh, the company that I used to um, buy dyes from, there was some issue with the dyes, mm-hmm. and they started to change color as I was. <laughs> As I was filming, yeah, it must have been a bad batch or something, but everything I'd filmed up until then had to be scrapped and I had to uh, start uh, all over again. So, so when I, when I come out with new courses, it's, it's not that I'm trying to be secretive. It's, uh, in case it's, it's given me a little bit of a buffer. <laughs> makes sense. That's a smart it's, way. Uh, yeah. When you, when you're working alone, it's, uh, you can never guarantee anything. A team of one. Yeah. But, um, definitely. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, anything new? Yeah, I mean, I've got a new wallet course coming out. So it's going to be um, a course on how to make a long wallet, which is a new one. I, and I do love long wallets because they're, they're kind of the classy version of the bifold mm-hmm. or the billfold, depending on how you, uh, where you're from. But uh, coat wallets have always fascinated me because it's, it's uh, kind of a classic, a classy thing I really enjoy because it makes it more of a statement. When you when you're wearing a nice coat and you bring out a nice coat wallet, it's uh, yeah. So I've, I've come out with that. It is a very popular request as well. So oh. it's something I've been listening to. So after that, I will be working on producing a handbag making course. Ah. So more more details uh, to follow for that. Well, that'll be that'll be awesome. I'm sure that's probably a really highly requested item as oh, well. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, For sure. Oh, cool. Well, I want to be respectful of your time, Phil, and just say thank you so much for uh, taking the time to record with me. So for everybody listening, leathercraftmasterclass.com, right? That's right. That's where to go. All right. (laughs) Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Cheers, buddy. Bye now. See you.